record. Okay, we're going. So this is IFSU Q&A with Bill Hartman. I think this is number four. Uh, Bill's there waving for us. Um, all you guys, if you have any questions, let's raise your hand or submit it in the chat or something so we're not all like uh, pushing and pushing. I know Campo does have to go to bed soon, so I'm sure he would appreciate if he could go first. And I think and I think I got a good one. I think it's stimulating. Oh, that's a that's a bold claim. Uh, okay. One one other thing for y'all, Eric Maness is about to show up on my screen. Um, if you're not Bill and Bill's talking, mute your thing so that we don't get this echo because it it cuts out his voice. Um, Campo, why don't yeah. you start us off? All right, these arms. Um. Maslow's levels of competency. Yeah. Um, unconscious incompetence. Unco conscious incompetence. Yeah. We. Yeah. Okay. okay. So let let's let's use an example of we analyze someone's gait. We see a whether or not you want to call it dysfunctional, but we see some sort of unconscious incompetence, right? Sure. We give them a corrective. And then we ask them to go through the gate cycle again, and it now becomes unconscious competence. How did we skip the two main levels? Or why, or how do we, how do we justify that? Well, it, really all you did was, was alter an input, the system processed it, and it spit out an output, right? Um, so let me alter your response with a different word. You didn't correct anything, right? I mean, how do you know, right? It's not a correction. All you did was get the system to behave. You gave it an input, the system processed that input, and it spits out a behavior that you like better, period. And that, that's, that's all that happened. So... I, I don't I don't think along those lines, you know, I'm more of like the um, what is it uh, cognitive associative uh, autonomous, right? When you talk about like skill acquisitions and things like that, that that's more along my lines of thinking. Um, and I understand what you're saying, but I, I don't think a complex adaptive system follows that same path, right? Because you know, you want to change a, you want to change somebody's squat, have them hold on to a kettlebell. You want to change it again, make the kettlebell two kilograms heavier, and you just changed it, right? Because you're not going through those stages. All you're merely doing is providing a series of, of inputs that the system has to process to spit out a behavior based on the context that you've created. So, um, you know, did they actually learn anything? Are they merely responding? Can they reproduce it later? You don't know, you don't have that information, do you? you? You just have a response, right? You have a stimulus and a response. So would, would, that, would that frame of reference, would, would looking through motor learning through his, that, those levels of competence, would you say that just loses merit simply because incompetence and competence hold a subjective value associated with whatever you're seeing yeah i mean this is not something that i spend a lot of time thinking about and so i probably can't speak intelligently about it um and again i, I think i'm more along the lines of of when one truly trying to acquire a skill versus merely a response based on altering the acute behavior right um basically you've just demonstrated that the system can adapt and that's a good thing under most circumstances could be a bad thing, but it, it's mostly a good thing. So I don't think that, that we're talking about the same, uh, same thing. Cause you, you're not talking about skill acquisition. You're merely talking about an altered response and, or an altered behavior based on the inputs provided. Right. What you want to be able to do then is and to, to go where you want to go. Now you're going to have to look at, okay, how long does it take for this, this change? to stick and i would say that based on the scenario that we're talking about you probably can't tell because the context will always change 
right? All I have to do is, if, it, if somebody's walking on a treadmill, all I have to do is change the speed of the treadmill, right? So now I just change states. So then the question becomes, can I destabilize from one state and, and achieve stability in the next one based on whatever the speed of the treadmill change is? You see what I'm getting at? You know, we're not talking about throwing or kicking or, you know, an interception task like catching a ball or, or handwriting or whatever that skill may be, right? So I, th I think where you want to go is more of like a skill acquisition kind of a concept versus an input processing output scenario that a complex adaptive system would demonstrate. Does that make sense? I can't hear you. Yeah, yes and no. So, I mean, th then that also depends on like your definition of a skill and the entire pro you know so like would would acquisition of that new um well there's okay look, can i stop you for a second so there's yeah. a difference between a skill that is that is something that that is is somewhat repeatable and a task which is, is merely something to meet the demands of 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 a, a context okay right? so, and so in, i think you're described what you described was was more of a task oriented scenario not an acquisition of skill so then what and again, I'm willing to be wrong on that. I could call Howie Zelaznik, who is my, my motor learning professor at Purdue. He's a really smart guy. He would probably know. So in, in your mind, what, what's the difference between a, 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 a task and a skill? Well, a, 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 ta a, a skill requires a, a level of, of, of competence, right, to, to make it somewhat repeatable within a, a variation. So um, a, a, a a task could be to shoot a, to shoot a, a free throw and a skill would be to consistently shoot accurately in my mind. Does that make sense? No. Yeah. I like that answer a lot actually. Yeah. So, and again, I, it's been a long time since I've looked at stuff like that. Um, but call Howie. He's at Purdue. Howie. Howie's the last name. Yeah. He's brilliant. He's actually brilliant. Does he answer emails? He actually does. Wow, how we Zelaznik. It's just like it sounds too. It's Z E L A S N I K I K. Would you be able to type that in the chat? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Appreciate it. Mm hmm He's at Purdue. You can't you can't miss him. Okay. He's he's like the staple of Purdue. If he left, <laughs> Purdue is no more. Well, I didn't. I didn't know who he was when I was taking his class, and it turns out that he's like this this amazingly brilliant guy that everybody knows who he is in like motor learning. It's the, like learning. Howie, Drew Brees, something like that. Oh, very much so. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. I'm gonna yeah, post a link to his uh, Purdue page for you, Campo, in the notes. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. I'm gonna. I'm going to catch my uh, 9 o'clock train now. Peace out. There you can. You guys, appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good one. Okay. Who's next? Brian Chung. Brian Chung's lurking back there. He hasn't said hi yet. And it sounds like he won't. Oh, there we go. He's... <laughs> He's secretively <laughs> lurking in the chat there. Eric Manis, we haven't said hi to you yet. Where's Eric? He's, he's standing further away from the camera. Get on right now, so I gotta keep it on mute. All right, what's next? Who's, who's got a question? Kevin, as a newcomer, do you have anything? Hi, Kevin. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Got it. Oh, All right. there we go. All right, not not at the moment. Just just absorbing the knowledge right now. <laughs> Fly on the wall. <laughs> if only we had some knowledge to share. <laughs> uh, Fabrizio, newcomer, two thirty in the morning. Can you still think? That's pretty late for me. I'm usually done around three p.m. <sighs> Stephen, do you have a question, bro? Uh, 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 of course. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw you like what two days ago. Oh, a lot's happened since then. 
Um, so this has happened a couple times with me now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, patient with restricted HGIR bilaterally. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as we're going through the exercise, it looks like they're able to maintain a ZOA, you know, no, you know, the rib and the ribs and lower ribs and abdomen are flush. When they breathe in, you know, you can see the upper rib cage expand. Awesome. But no change in IR. Mm -hmm. What am I missing? Is there something else? What do you, what do you got in the lowers? Uh, for this patient in particular, she was uh, patho PEC on both sides of her hips. Okay. What about IRs and stuff? And then lowers. Uh, uh, you know, IR, ER, you know, she had plenty of IR, you know, maybe 40 degrees on each oh, side. A lot, huh? um, mm -hmm. e ER, you know, maybe a little less, 35 or so. Okay. Um, and I don't know, I don't know, you know, from just viewing the exercise, I'm like, no, oh, she's got it. But then, you know, I, I retest and like, you know, obviously something was off. Yeah. I mean, very difficult for me to offer you anything, but okay. Can yeah. I tell you about what happened today to me? Uh, absolutely. That might help. Sure. Okay. So we had, we had a, a baseball player in the uh, um, uh, college baseball player. Um, and uh, everything was looking really good. Like he walked in the door and, and uh, full variability of his pelvis walking in the door with, with, but no internal rotation on either shoulder and no horizontal. And um, so I'm thinking, oh, and no, no hip abduction uh, in lowers, actually. So not full variability, but sagittal. He had sagittal. And, uh, um, you know, went, went through the typical processes and, and he's not changing at all, right? I mean, nothing is changing. Yeah. So... I do some uh, uh, rib cage work and he's got this great expansion, right? So everything looks like everything should just be perfect today. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just not happening. And it, it, it was really confounding for a while. It took about 20 minutes of, of, of work to, to kind of figure this thing out. And, and uh, turns out that, uh, and, and this is this is based on my intent. I can't tell you. I, I'm, my X-ray vision is not very good, so I couldn't actually see his spine, right? But it, it turns out that, it, that what it appears to be is that he was extended way up. Okay, so so we're talking like a, a mid to upper thoracic um, spinal extension, causing a lot of reorientation of of the shoulder girdle position and blocking the IRs. And so what we ended up doing was doing a bilateral uh, hip ER activity with upper extremity ER while maintaining a posterior rotation of the ilium. So you might look at that as, as like a synchronized glute max activity. Yeah. That makes sense yeah. when I say that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, um, um, and as soon as we did that, everything dropped and everything went back to normal. It, 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 so, so one of the things that, that you, you kind of have to understand is, is that the, uh, the, these extension patterns that occur higher up away from the pelvis really do influence everything on down. And when you get somebody with like crazy internal rotation of their hips, like right off the bat, yeah. and you go, oh, this is good. Not so much. <laughs> no, the other ones always suck. Because a lot of times, a lot of times what you're looking at is an orientation of the pelvis an orientation of the pelvis in a in an in a an anteriorly rotated position, which which puts the acetabulum in such a position that you get this crazy internal rotation, right? You might even have what appears to be normal adduction, yeah, right? That, that, but you're actually adducting them. You're actually adducting them in a position of flexion, and so so all of your tests suddenly look clean, right? Yeah, and that's what we had today. Mm -hmm. And like I said, everything exactly. looks so good and, and, and he felt good, which, which is another confounding thing that, uh, um, you know, you, you would expect to see a, a, a much bigger change. Now he has some nice small changes across the board, but, but as soon as we 
um, addressed the, the extension that was much more above the pelvis, that's boom. I mean, just like he melted and, um, and he could tell the difference too. So one of the things that I would, I would, I would say is kind of look in that respect is to look just further up as far as where you're, you're making your, uh, determination as to, to what orientation you're seeing. Right. And, and sometimes it's not, you know, all clear and, 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 uh, picture perfect. I don't know if that helps a little bit, but, but, uh, it, it, yeah, it, when, when you say extension higher up, mm-hmm. I, I guess, how, it, how do you, how do you determine kind of where, you know, when you say, ex, you know, kind of mid thoracic extension or uh, what tests or, or what are you looking at to determine well, that? So, like, so if you see like a, a limitation in what you, you have an apparent no limitation in, in the expansion of the upper thorax during yep. breathing. Yep. Right. But you still see the IR deficits and you still see the horizontal deficits. Mm-hmm. It's like, what's going on there. Right. Yeah. So uh, uh, imagine bringing the scaps closer and closer together on the backside of the body. And then what would that do to the uh, orientation of the glenoid? And then how would that affect shoulder motion? And then how would it affect the lengths of the soft tissues? Right. So, so again, this guy walks in with bilateral shoulder limitations, but apparently you know, clean elsewhere. Mm-hmm. And, and I just found that hard to believe. And like I said, it was a little confounding at first. And then, but once we got the, uh, um, uh, the management of the thorax uh, to clean up, then uh, everything was fine. And, and, and we had a little bit more of a, I mean, like even his hip measures changed when we didn't even have to address that really all that much. So it sounds like, you know, the initial, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it sounds like you're saying the, the patient's scapular were maybe more retracted than we would expect to see. Yes, sir. Um, I guess then what led you to like the synchronized glute max activity? Cause that they're actively ERing their, their shoulder with, with that exercise. Right. And that would further drive retraction. No, it wouldn't. No, no, it wouldn't, young man. Why would I let him do that? That's, that's what I'm asking. Well, okay. So <laughs> if, if, if I let him do what he wanted, absolutely it would, right? But mm-hmm. the idea is to get him to externally rotate without retracting. Okay. So there's an element of coaching here, right? Sure. Okay. So, so what, I guess what, what's kind of your, the thought process at, at why that synchronized glute activity worked well for, for that particular patient. Okay. So, so I have, I have a, a pelvis that is oriented in an anterior rotation. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so if, if I was oriented in an anterior rotation, would, would your uh, um, outlets be abducted or adducted? <laughs> Say so it's just orientation right yeah okay it's just oriented forward Mm -hmm. so the outlets would still be open yeah so now i can afford to actually bilaterally er Mm -hmm. okay because i got i got adductors on both sides that were on Mm -hmm. okay and i have no internal rotation which means that he was his pelvis was oriented so far forward that he internally rotated. So there's no more internal rotation to go. And I had adductors that had stayed on. So wouldn't it behoove me to reverse the position of the pelvis ER, both of those femurs, Mm -hmm. right? Inhibit my adductors, Mm -hmm. close the outlets to a certain degree. Right. And then I keep the thorax expanded while he externally rotates both shoulders without retracting. Right. So now he's got control of the thorax. So he's not extending his thorax as he tries to retract. Does that make sense? I guess. How how do you explain the the change in in uh, upper upper extremity measures and just the fact that he has control of. He expanded his thorax anteriorly and posteriorly. Mm -hmm. Right. 
without retracting the scapula. Okay. So now I have a thorax for the scap to rest on. So now instead of having a, a, um, a, 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 a orientation of the scapula that would actually block um, my uh, rotation okay. and limit my horizontal abduction, I, I have a, a normal resting position of the scapula on the thorax because I've expanded the thorax anteriorly and posteriorly. Mm -hmm. Okay. But but like a, a protraction activity wasn't giving him that like no because we already tried that or, yeah we already gone that direction yeah in fact I did two of them and then we did manual work mm -hmm. on the rib cage and again everything looked great mm -hmm. right I even had him off his back and so we you know we we gave him that opportunity to and and he can do it he can do mm -hmm. it but you know it just didn't go okay oh. So again, I'm, I'm rationalizing my, my intent. And mm -hmm. then I'm also, you know, I, I'm confirming myself with the outcome. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so you have to give me that, that little bit of leeway, right? Uh, so so w with the retraction limiting horizontal abduction, is that simply because the pec is becoming elongated already in that position? Yes, sir. That would be, that would be, my, that would be my thought process. Yes. And so with all the left pec inhibition activities that PRI typically does, I guess my thought would be the pec's already stretched. Why are we doing more? Why are we breathing in, in these positions while stretching the pec even further, if that could be our limiter in horizontal abduction? Sure. I mean, I, I don't disagree with you. Do, do you do... Have do I ever you, done them? Or, it, you know, it, it, is that, you know, is that a rational way of, of, of thinking in regards to maybe the pecs are already too long in that right BC pattern? We actually need to... Why do you think that... Okay. I, see, I don't necessarily agree that they're always inhibition activities. For the targeted... Just because they're called something, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't necessarily agree that that would be what you're actually inhibiting. Right, mm -hmm. you got a rib cage involved there. That that's a pretty big influence. You've got a scapular position that's a pretty big influence. Mm -hmm. So I don't necessarily agree that they're always inhibition activities. Okay, it, you're, you're you're altering position. Would you say the left pec is typically already eccentrically oriented in a right BC pattern, or no? Depends. <laughs> I mean, yes and no. I mean, I can give you, I can give you, and you know as well as I do that you could have scenarios of both, right? Hmm. I, would, I guess I'm just thinking typical, you know, sternum oriented to the right, mm -hmm. left, left scapular retraction, like it seems like, you know, the two attachments. Under that scenario, I would think that it would be in a lengthened position already, yes. Moving apart, okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you. Cool. Look at that depth. We don't normally go that deep, do we? <laughs> um, Patrick had asked for clarification on the exercise. It, it was supine with the posterior pelvic rotation and the knees fall out and fall in. They don't fall out, you push them out. Okay, fair enough. Well, uh, no, you have to actively, because oh, you're trying to inhibit adduction. Okay, do you have a, did you put a band around his knees? I did. Okay. Okay. This makes sense. So they, they definitely don't fall out. <laughs> what's the um, significance with, uh, like, that's, that's one thing I guess I'm a little confused on. Like, when you ex, which movement you pattern with the exhale and which you pattern with the inhale? Um, so it, uh, there's a natural external rotation associated with inhalation and a natural uh, uh, internal rotation with exhalation. So you, you, that's what you want to synchronize. Internal so rotation. VR, with, internal IR. rotation with, okay. Got it. How about with, um, I know that was one where, um, I don't, it was a 90-90 breathing technique. To, yeah. I think it was to posteriorly rotate the pelvis. I saw a video 
is it you inhale with knee ex with uh, knee extension and exhale with knee flexion? At least my explanation might not be the best. Are you doing like an alternating activity? Yes. Okay, I know which one you're talking about. Yeah, it's it's knee extension in inhale, knee flexion, exhale. And is that the same uh, reasoning behind? What's the reasoning behind that then? Because you're, you're you're trying to do this. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, when you inhale, the ilium rotates forward, right? Mm -hmm. So as you extend the knee, rec fem pulls on the pelvis and it pulls it forward in a forward rotation. Mm -hmm. So you want to synchronize that rotation of the ilium with, with inhalation. Does that help? Yeah, got it. That makes sense. Yeah. So inhalation is coupled with in anterior rotation of the pelvis and external no, rotation. No, 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 no. Let me stop you, okay? Because I yeah. want you to get this right. It's the rotation of the ilium. Rotation of the ilium. Not the pelvis. Got it. Okay, there's a difference. Because the sacrum and the, and the ilium can move in opposite directions. Yeah. It's not one big piece that always goes together. They mm -hmm. work in opposition. And that's a huge, uh, uh, huge concept to understand because that, that's what drives a lot of decision making and what exercises you're going to select. Got okay. It. Mm hmm. Internal rotation, no. Inhalation, anti rotation of the ilium. Think and I breathe in, it goes out. Yeah. I breathe out, it goes in, right? And then, and then internal rotation and is. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. Because the sacrum goes in opposite directions. Mm -hmm. How come so, then internal rotation is combined with, uh, or inhalation is combined with external rotation and and exhalations combined with internal rotation. Say, say that again, I'm sorry. Uh, how, the, how come, what's the reasoning behind the external and internal rotation pattern with uh, inhalation ex and exhalation? Under what circumstance are we talking here, bud? Uh, yes, back to the first example, the um, supine AB so, so you breathe in and you ER? Mm -hmm. And you breathe out and you IR? Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. What's like? What's the reasoning behind that? Why is it? Why is it? Breathe in and external rotate. Breathe out, internal rotate. So what I'm trying to do is I'm I'm trying to follow the normal mechanics without um, the normal mechanics of respiration without um, losing the uh, without driving the scapula. Okay, to where I'm, I'm driving into an extension based position, right? So I'm trying to teach you to control the internal and external rotation during respiration. Where, so this guy was defaulting into this, this like uh, a much more, I hate to use the term, but, but I, it's only one that pops into my head right now. He's, he's using more of an aggressive like retraction type of a position of the scapula. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, and, and as he was breathing in, um, and I didn't want him to use that. So I wanted to put him in that position, but, but restrict him from going where he was taking himself. Right. Got it. Cause I'd done all the, like the forward reaching and pushing and, and all that kind of stuff that you would typically do. Right. And he could, and honestly, he could put air everywhere I wanted him to go. Um, but he wasn't controlling it. Um, at the, in the, like the upper thorax and in the scapular area as well when he was inhaling in other positions. And so as soon as we would, we would put him in another position, he would lose it. And so, you know, just, we, again, you have to coach this. You, you, you can't just default into and say, okay, just all I'm doing is ERing and all I'm doing is IRing. It's like there's a very specific way to, to coach people through that activity so they execute it correctly. Got it. That makes sense. Uh, so it's, I, it's like you know you, you try to take them away from what they default in. You know, that would be your typical plan of action. You know, you you would do that. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Okay. And and so I did all that stuff, and it didn't help. 
And so I, I took him in a direction that he would want to go, but I restricted how he did it. Got it. Yeah. It's hard to do without practical examples sitting in front of you. I know it's hard to see. Yeah, I'm trying to picture it in my head, but it's make, it does make sense. I do want to take a PRI course to get more sure. this further understanding of it, and I'm planning on it during the winter time. Um, I know I had a question. Uh, I'm currently I'm in the team sports setting and uh, working with the college sports team, and I guess in that setting it's a lot tougher to do like one-on-one -on -one ass assessments because you just don't really have the time to. In that case, if you did want to like like pattern the or repattern or pattern breathing habits so that they avoid getting into these different positions. How, what would be like the, I guess, the best way to do that? If you're working in like a group um, setting. Do you do, you do warm up activities? Like, we integrate like 99 or. Um, no, I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm just talking about anything. Like you mm -hmm. do any dynamic warm up activities? Like moving yep. stuff? Yep, a bunch of those. Okay. Give me like a for instance, give me three exercises. Uh, inchworm to frog. Say what now? Uh, it's called an inchworm to frog with, with integrated with the world's greatest stretch. Okay. All right. I, I think I got you. And then, so, like, so, uh, like, so they're walking up into kind of like a downward dog type of position? Mm -hmm. So they're in a downward dog position and then they walk up the hands to a push up position and they bring up one leg, bring up one hip, and then. They they twist Yep, exactly. Okay, awesome. That's the main. That's one of the main ones that we do. So, so all you need to do there, young man, is to sequence the breathing at the right time, mm -hmm. and you got yourself a golden activity, right? Mm -hmm. So, if I'm in a push-up position, where would the, where would where would the, the path of least resistance? Where do I want that path of least resistance to be in regards to the breathing? If I'm in a push-up position. If you're in a push-up position, then. Yeah. Where's where's most of the muscle activity? On the front side of the body or the back side of the body? The front. Okay, cool. So then I could, probably can't get air there, right? So air will fall in the but back. But if I if I push hard enough and and I and I take a breath in that position, shouldn't I be able to expand the the posterior ribcage? Mm -hmm. Cool. That makes sense. Problem solved. Number one. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I walk up in the niche while I'm into that downward dog type position, right? Am I correct? Yep. Okay. So I'm inverted. Yes. Mm. Shouldn't I be able to breathe in that position too? Yes. So that's my arms overhead, which means that I have to fill the, the top part of the thorax, right? Mm. I, have, I, I have my guts resting on my diaphragm, which is going to come into a position of exhalation, but I'm going to assist with exhalation in that position. And then if I hit a breath from that position without allowing my, my belly to balloon out, does that not expand my rib cage in, in the, that posterior aspect as well? Yeah. When I got upper and I got posterior taken care of in, in that same exercise, right? Mm -hmm. Now I move into the world's greatest stretch. That's an asymmetrical pelvis, am I correct? Yes. So I got one leg forward, one leg back. So I just created a twist in my pelvis. So I got one side of the pelvic diaphragm that's gonna be elevated. I'm gonna be at one side that's descended, correct? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then I'm gonna twist the thorax which means I'm going to fill up one side of the rib cage versus the other a whole lot better. So now I've just trained my pelvic diaphragm to, to exhale on one side and my thorax to fill up on the opposite side. Am I correct? So then each so position is a new breath. And everything you needed to do with that one activity. All you got to do it. is the breathing right. Got it. So each time they go into that position, it's, that's a new breath or breathing yeah. cycle. Exactly. Got it. Exactly. Interesting. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. That's yeah. really cool. Yeah. You don't have to be fancy. Mm. You don't have to you don't have to do, you know, any particular exercise. You just gotta know where 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 the airflow would be restricted under those circumstances, where it's not restricted and where you want the air to go. And you can put the body in, in just about any position and you can draw the airflow. There. So generally then air will be restricted where there's muscle activity that's restricting opening of the or expansion sure so do a side plank where's the muscle activity the side close to the ground or yeah so do you think you're going to get a bunch of air there no absolutely not 
where's it going to go? It's going to go somewhere else, right? What if, if I want it to go up to the other side, what do I have to do? You could flip around. No. <laughs> so I'm, on, I'm in a left side plank. Uh -huh. I want the air to go to the right side. Oh, you just need to breathe. Okay, but what if it goes forward? Uh, then you could, I guess you could like hold your rib cage down with your abs. What if I just exhaled first, right? Mm. And then I, did, I, I cue them to, to maintain that position. And if I breathe, where's the air going to go based, based on where the muscle activity is, right? It's yeah. going to go away from where the greatest muscle activity is. Got it. Go and then up, it goes, yep. Right? Make sense? Hmm? Yeah. You already know the answers. You just haven't put, you haven't put it together with the breathing before. Mm -hmm. Piece of cake, my friend. <laughs> is there any specific way that you like to cue people to breathe? I know that I've seen videos of you using balloons. Yeah, the balloons help. But I mean, you don't need them. Some people, just... some people do great without them. Some people, some people need the extra um, uh, help with that. You know, as far as like learning how to control pressures. Some people need the, the, the oral component of it, right? Because they, they don't know how to breathe through their nose because they don't spend any time breathing through their nose. And so then that helps coordinate that as well. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of benefits to that. So generally then would it be in through the nose, out through the mouth, and like a, is there like a ratio inhale versus exhale duration? Yes, yeah, so you have to have exactly 48% inhale and 50% 50% exit. No, <laughs> <laughs> there's no way. There's no way to measure that. There's no way to measure that. Do you do a longer exhale versus inhale? Or In, just... it, again, it depends on what you're trying to do. I mean, if you're mm -hmm. if you're trying to to quiet down muscle tone, that would that would typically be the way to go. It, it, there's a concept called respiratory sinus arrhythmia. Mm -hmm. So, so that's the, the, the shift of your, your autonomic nervous system from sympathetic to parasympathetic. You understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's flight or fight or rest and digest. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you inhale, you become more sympathetic. Your heart rate variability goes down. Okay. And, and that's more of a stimulatory side of the autonomic nervous system. And then as you mm -hmm. exhale, you become more parasympathetic. Okay. And mm -hmm. then heart rate variability increases. And that would tend to uh, reduce uh, uh, the excitatory component of what and all, right? So mm -hmm. it depends on what I'm trying to do and how I would want somebody to breathe, right? Okay. So if I want to crank you up and I want to get you excited, probably don't want to be, you know, doing chill out type breathing, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if I want to improve your ability to move, it may behoove me to do some of that. Got it. Thanks, Bill. That, well, that was really helpful. Hope that helps. Yeah, I'm gonna Man, there's a lot of stuff in it. That was awesome. <laughs> What's that? I just, I think it's really cool. It's a really cool illustration of, it's like the concepts are simple. You know a lot of anatomy, so <laughs> you make it, like it's simple in your head, right? But I think it illustrates that this is, I mean, that's why we talk about stuff like anatomy it's because once you understand that you can make your own breathing test right but unfortunately anatomy is learned out of context and and that's what makes it so hard to understand right but if i tell you if i tell you that um um if i turn my rib cage to the right um my uh inspiratory inter intercostals are more active on the side to which i'm turning so if I turn my shoulders to the right, my inspiratory intercostals will become more active. So there's more expansion in that direction. That's just simple anatomy, right? But if I hit that, if I hit a breath now with, with, with right rotation relative to my pelvis, now I'm expanding this side of the rib cage. And that's, what, that's, that's how you learn anatomy. That's the best way to learn. So I could just say that, well, you know, your inspiratory intercostals are between, you know, the first through sixth ribs. And um, when you breathe in, they're more around the sternum here. And, but, but again, it's just like it it's becomes rote memorization and then that's boring and then it doesn't stick. But if I tell you that this rotation occurs and you get intercostals working on one side more than the other and you can associate that with something, then obviously it's going to stick better. And that's, that's how anatomy probably needs to be taught. And we, we were talking about that 
today in the purple room, you know, because we always default back to anatomy. And, and, but if, if you learn it in, within a, a, an, an, an analogy or an association with something else, then it makes more sense. So if we talk about sprained ankles and it's like, okay, um, what if you sprain your ankle, you roll your ankle inwards into an inversion sprain and your toes are higher than your heel, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to, you're, t you tend to sprain the, the posterior talofibular ligament more so than the anterior talofibular ligament, right? But most people sprain their, their ankles toes down. And so they sprain the one in the front, which is the anterior. But now, now you understand, you have a better understanding of what those ligaments restrain in regards to movement just by having that discussion versus these are the three ligaments on the outside of the ankle. They attach here, here, and here. And, and so that doesn't make much sense. So whenever you're trying to learn something, when you're trying to learn anything, we learn everything by association. Create a scenario under which, you know, if you're trying to learn anatomy, what's going on you know, under these circumstances, you'll have a much better time trying to, to learn how the anatomy works and you won't have to just sit there and memorize attachments and positions and such. It, and it'll be much more meaningful to you if you can create an association. I love that. Read the, book, make it, read the book, Make It Stick. How about that? Read, make it stick. Is that by like, Heath Cummins? I, hang on. It is make it stick. No, not uh, not made to stick. This is make it stick. It's uh, Peter Brown is one of the primary authors. Ooh, it's about learning. So, so it's it's actually evidence based learning. Who first discovered that? I know Jay was pimping that a couple of years ago. What make it stick? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's good. I picked it up late. I don't, I don't know what took me so long. It's the best training book I've ever read. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's seriously, it's a training book. It's, it, it's about, it's about learning, but, but I mean, you'll, you'll see everything to do with training. If you read that book, how to program a, a, a micro cycle is in there. If you pay attention to it, um, how to organize a, a, a workout, um, how to alter loading, uh, it's all in there. It doesn't say that stuff, but if you if you read it from that perspective, you'll see it. I'm gonna definitely gotta check that one out. I recently picked up Fergus Connolly's book. That one's interesting too. Game Changers. Have you guys heard of that one? Hang on a second. Nope, never heard of it. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Um Actually, so, you know, we, we've talked about c complex adaptive systems on Campo's uh, question, and, and he lays that part out for you in, in that, that first eh, third of the book, maybe? I can't remember. Um, I'm, I'm halfway through it, maybe. Um, and I'm skipping around a little bit, too, because it's, it, it's a pretty good framework. I mean, obviously, it's a, it, he's done an excellent job. It's a, it's a great book to, to have. Um, there, there's a lot of... Uh, things that I'm, I'm sure his second book will fill in the gaps for people, but, but it's an excellent framework. What was this book? Game Changer. By Fergus Connolly. Connolly. Okay. It's a C O N N O L L Y. It's a white cover. Uh, yes. Would you like me to hold it up again? No, I got it. I was, I was looking for it when you held it up first time. <laughs> Um, okay, oh, so sorry, you're gonna have to read another book, my brother. <laughs> yeah, Brian Chung says his <laughs> pile of books that he has to read is already four feet high. <laughs> All you got to do is just turn them over, and that's four feet long instead of four feet high, and it doesn't seem as daunting. <laughs> um, Fabrizio had a question earlier. Uh, he's in a an environment where he can't talk very loudly. He said. Uh, why is hip internal rotation so important in, say, a squat? And is there any correlation between anterior pelvic tilt and a loss of hip internal rotation? Well, with the anterior pelvic tilt, there can be, and there, and, and it, so it's going to be an it depends kind of a question. Um, so the anterior tilt can reorient the, the position of the acetabulum to, in such a way that it will, it will create a bony block to internal rotation. Um, or 
that again, depending on how it's, it's an, so like all anterior tilts are not the same. Some occur due to um, extension above the pelvis and some occur with extension within the pelvis, if that makes sense. Um, and the, the ones that, that uh, occur above, depending on how significant they are, can actually create a bony block to internal rotation. And so if I reorient the position of the acetabulum um, and, and I, and I uh, retrovert the acetabulum in doing so, I'll, I'll usually block internal rotation. And that also makes it difficult to be a, a really good deep squatter. So, so uh, deep squatters tend to be able to either, either antivert the acetabulum, which, which increases the amount of available internal rotation, um, and, and well, again, allows you to squat deeper. Um, and it also increases the amount of hip flexion you have. So again, it makes, it, makes for a much better squatter. Does that answer that question? I think it does. I can't hear you, Lance. You're muted. I think it does answer your question. Can you clarify one more? Um, I think you said retroversion and then antiversion. Yes. Which, so, okay, so. Would you like to see it? Yeah, do you have a pelvis? I was trying I to do. find an image. Of course. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I don't even know why I said that. <laughs> Is there ever a time you do not have a pelvis with you? Say, say again? Is there ever a time you do not have a pelvis with you? Well, maybe a it's a or a wedge. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, acetabulum, right? Side view. See it? So if I do that. You see how it, it kind of covers the, it, this would be the head of the femur in here. So it would cover the head of the femur and it rotates posteriorly. You see that? So that can block internal rotation just by creating a bony block. Okay. Now, if the whole pelvis orients this way, it doesn't retrovert the acetabulum. Right. So there may not be a bony block to internal rotation. If it rotates, three-dimensional, like that, that will retrovert the acetabulum. That does not, okay? If I can do that, if I can posteriorly rotate the ilium, I antivert the acetabulum, and that increases my internal rotation and flexion, and that's my Olympic weightlifter, most likely. Does that help? I love that. I think Fabrizio is liking that too. Uh, Patrick, that's exactly what he was talking about earlier. Does that correlation make sense? Yeah. Uh, I, Bill, I thought that was really cool. Oh, no, toys. <laughs> that ain't that. They're different. Okay. It's, what, what do you mean by antivert and retrovert the acetabulum? I know. Okay, so watch. Watch. Watch here. You got it? So all I'm doing is, so I'm gonna do it from the front first, okay? So here's the, I don't have very good light. Let me do it on this side. So there's the acetabulum here. You see it? Can you see the acetabulum open? Well, I'm gonna make it disappear. It's a magic trick, ready? It's gone. See it? Oh, so that's, in the, eh? that's retroverted. Got it. That's, and that, see how it's open? That's antiverted. It's gone. It's covering the head of the femur, blocks internalization. This frees it up. That's different from when the femur is retroverted or antiverted. That is correct. It's not the same. This is acetabular antiversion and retroversion. Okay. That, the, the, femoral, the femoral side of things has to do with the, uh, the angle of the neck relative to the femur, the, the shaft of the femur. Okay. Perfect. Who's got questions? We got time for one or two more. Eric Manis, now that you're sitting there. I'm soaking it all in. Okay. Fly on the wall. You and Kevin, fly on the wall. 
<laughs> I just remember, I reserve the right to be wrong. Everything that I've said tonight. Do you have one, Kevin? Well, just to cl- just to follow up on that. So if if that anterior tilt happens without the rotation, that's coming from above the pelvis. Okay. Yes, gotcha. sir. Yes, sir. That's a good clarification. And that, and that's something kind of important to note because it does change your approach as to how you're going to address that when you're trying to alter movement, right? Because they're not the same. So how would you address one, like if the, the rotation versus it happening at the lumbar spine, what's your differing approach to correct that? Well, the, so the one that has the rotation inside the pelvis may actually have more of a frontal plane related issue. Okay. Um, so you, you sort of have to start the same because I, I still have to, I still have to posteriorly rotate the ilium in both scenarios. I have an ilium that is going forward, right? So it's either rotated within the pelvis like that, or it's good like that. Right. So I'm going to have to, so from a sagittal perspective, I have to sort of approach it the same way. If, if, I, if it's just the whole pelvis orienting forward and I, and, I, and I posteriorly rotate it, I usually don't have the frontal plane issue because I've got a pelvic diaphragm uh, position and I've got, I've, you know, it, it's right where I want it to be, whereas this might still be an issue, right? Okay. But your test, your tests tell you what to do in that scenario. Intern Corey posted a question. It's probably Allison who actually asked this question. <laughs> it was. Uh, uh, hey, do you want to just say it? Yeah. So I know what FA and AF stand for, and I hear uh, you guys use it a lot around the gym. But I'm just not really sure the different implications of it. So one is femur acetabulum and then acetabulum femur. But what's the key distinguishing difference between them? Because they're the same pieces, if that makes sense. I'm just confused about the difference between the two and how you treat them. No, wrong. No, I'm just trying to think of an easy way to do this without... Um, going where I don't want to go. Um, let me get my pelvis. So this is my femur. I don't have a femur on me right now. Okay. Fits in there, right? If I do that, that's pelvis on femur. Yes. Shake your head so I can see it. Cool. And then that is femur on pelvis. Okay. So does that answer part of the question? Yes. Okay. So what's the other part? How do you treat it and what specific situations are going to affect the pelvic outlet? Could you ask something that doesn't require a two-day course? (laughs) (laughs) If it were that simple, wow. Um, there, there's, I literally there's, just texted her that. <laughs> you got, you got two day discussion. Question. I mean, it's, it's a that's a really <laughs> big like. How would you treat it? Uh, yeah. I don't know. What are the needs? What so what's like, the context? Like, what are we talking? Of, in what a lot are of needs? Sets, you talk a lot about like FAIR type exercises. I see a lot of FAIR stuff. So I guess how does that affect the pelvic outlet? Um. Okay. So it, it can open it, right? So how's your anatomy, young man? I guess we're about to find out. <laughs> is is Casey, Casey's not with you guys, right? No. Nope. Okay, because he's doing an in-service tomorrow that he doesn't know about. Uh, <laughs> so pelvis, yes. Bottom of the pelvis. The, the, the uh, muscles that adduct your hips, right? Attach right here, okay? And so if I bring my knees together, it will do that. 
right? Kind of makes sense if I'm squeezing it together. But if I leverage them, so if I put something between my knees and then squeeze together where the knees can't move, the adductors still turn on, and so it'll do that. It'll pull them open. Does that make sense? So that would be the most important thing that, based on your question that, that you wanted answered, that's what that will tell you. Okay. That definitely helps. Okay. But yeah, if I just squeeze my knees together, you close it. You, you, you make it narrower, right? But if I leverage it apart by putting something between the knees, it opens. Let's leave it at that for now. Is that fair? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. That's a, a really good tie-in with the previous distinctions between the, the extension pattern that comes from above versus comes from within. Like that's, that's a good way to address the comes from within stuff. Yeah. Um, any closing thoughts? So let's see, I reserve the right to be wrong on everything that I've stated. Um, everything that I've just shown you with the pelvis has been exaggerated to a significant degree to make a point. I'm just trying to cover bases here. I'm glad you said that. What's that? Some people. <laughs> well, they think it moves that much? Yeah, well, they're like, oh, of course it does that if you're moving it that way. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Okay, so let's let's close by talking about models, right? Okay. okay. So let's let's just quote the, the great George Box, right? All models are wrong, some are useful. Right? Why do we use models? Well, let's talk about Daniel Dennett. So Daniel Dennett is a modern day philosopher, and he says we use models to take these incredibly complex systems and complex entities and complex processes and they help us discuss them and try to understand them to at least a small degree that they become useful, okay? Doesn't mean they're accurate. Doesn't mean they have to be accurate, all right? They're just models to help us communicate and to try to understand these really, really difficult things to understand. And if we can be remotely successful by using them, then they're probably a good model. And we also have, uh, the ability to change these models as we learn new things. And so your model should evolve over time, depending on whatever your model is. My model's different from Lance's. My model's different from Eric's. My, my model's probably different from Jeff's or Steven's, right? But yet, they're still useful. Whatever your model is right now, whatever system you champion right now, that's okay as long as you understand that it's wrong and then as long as you keep learning and you start to expand your model, so you expand your, your level of understanding to allow you to approach many different scenarios. Cool? I love it. Because I, I said wrong stuff tonight. Guaranteed. But maybe it was useful and allows us to figure something else out, right? So, so I'm not afraid to, to, to say something wrong as long as, I mean, I was successful with a patient today based on a thought process and an intent that I had. I'm probably wrong in, on my explanation, but that was my intent and therefore it did succeed. Um, so that was my explanation. And again, I'm willing for that model, the entire model to be wrong, but it was successful. So that doesn't make it a bad thing. And you know what? You can disagree with me, and I'm okay with that. I love to disagree with you. <laughs> it's it, I'm I, I'm okay with that because it, and it's fun. Yeah. Well, how does productive discussion arise if we all agree on the same thing? And we all sit around and we go, "Oh yeah, you're great." No, no, you're great. <laughs> no, you're great. Um, you know and. Well, some of that's nice and all, but, um, but seriously, it's like we have to be able to discuss these. Th these are complex issues, which means that there's more than one right answer, right? I mean, uh, you know, uh, how, do you, how do you get your keys? When you lock your keys in the car, how many ways are there to get your keys out? I mean, seriously, how many ways are there to get your keys out? There's a lot, right? Which one's the right answer? It depends. 
It depends on this on the context. If your baby's in the back seat and your car's on fire, you break the freaking window and you get the baby out, and then you might think about getting your keys out. But if it's a beautiful day and you're down by the beach, you might not worry so much. Maybe you call the locksmith and maybe he drives down an hour later and you're talking with the girl in the bikini and you know everything goes really well well, and then you get to know each other and you fall in love and you get married and you have a couple of kids and then they go to the beach and they lock their keys in the car. <laughs> Such is the circle of life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bill, have you read The Big Picture by Sean Carroll? No. He, he talks the whole time. The whole, his whole premise of the book is, and so we learn. He has this great voice. I, don't, I can't do it. But he, so we learn. I listened you to You didn't it. read it either. You were listening to it. <laughs> I know you're not a believer in that. <laughs> but, but I got it done. It would still be not read if I had tried to read it. But I listened to it. And he said, we just, we learn things and then we update our credences, which is basically his, his model, you know. Yeah. Um, cool stuff. Cool stuff. All right, guys. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having uh, late arrivers, Dan and Phil. I think you might have been an hour behind us or... I just saw it on Facebook. Oh, okay. Well, thanks for trying to pick up something. Worst Tommy award ever. <laughs> uh, maybe next time. There will be one in another month. Uh, I got one scheduled with Mike Robertson here in Ooh. almost a month, maybe three weeks or so. Yeah, that was for you, Patrick. That's all because of you. Ooh. You better be able to make it to that one. <laughs> What's it? Wednesday, Thursday? One of those it'll two? Be, it'll be a Thursday, same time, 8.30. I think it's 10, 12, but you guys will get an email soon. Cool. All right, guys. Uh, thanks again for joining us. And... Sayonara.